Welcome back to another episode of your favorite podcast, Deek to Deek. In this episode, I spend time talking to champion and trailblazer, Bob Grant. In 1964, Bob Grant and Kenneth Butch Henry were the first black football student athletes to enroll at a division one institution in the South. Uncle Bob was kind enough to stop by and share his story of growing up in Jacksonville, North Carolina, the courage it took to break barriers and much, much more. Take a listen to part one, and as always, go Deeks. Every day. So we're here today with Mr. Bob Grant. So let's start from the beginning. So you're from Jacksonville, North Carolina. Sort of paint a picture for Deacon Nation of what it was like growing up in Jacksonville during that time. Well, I grew up in uh, Jacksonville in the late 40s and the 50s. And uh, I guess that the biggest positive about uh, uh, that uh, area, one second, I, I've got a, a, a thing on my screen, Desiree will take care of it when she comes back. The, uh, was uh, Camp Lejeune, the Marine base. You know, was there in the Camp Lejeune is uh, the, the United States largest amphibious base like on the planet. So there was always uh, a lot of activity there. Uh, it was during segregation or apartheid times, or whatever you choose they care to call it, whereas uh, society was separated uh, by race. But not only by race, it was separated by class uh, to some degree as well. And uh, Desiree, yes, I have this sign on there. Can you oh, get it off? yeah, just for okay. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, it's great to have good assistance. <laughs> you spe especially when you're fooling around with this new high tech stuff. <laughs> But in any case, uh, society was divided in some ways there, but society was together in a lot of other ways. Uh, there was black town, there was you know, the white city, the white town. Uh, after sundown, if you were white, you didn't wanna be caught in the black neighborhoods. And uh, if you, vice versa, if you were black, you didn't want to be caught in the white neighborhoods like you then. Uh, there were a lot of challenges there. Um, a lot of those challenges were based on things that had, had happened historically and people had just not had, a, uh, had time to adjust. Everybody just kept doing the way that they had done things all the way back to the early 1900s, 1700s, 1800s, thank you, et cetera. But it became obvious in the uh, years that I was growing up there that a, a change had to come about. It was time for a change to come about. The Marine Corps itself was uh, not integrated until the uh, early 40s. And my high school coaches were the men, were the black men who integrated the Marine Corps. And they were called the Mumford Pointers uh, there. Um, growing up in the South, uh, we worked. You started to work when you were very, very young. Uh, it might be in, uh, on farms sometimes, did some of that. But with my grandpa who raised me, when he was born in Haiti in 1894 and fought in World War, well, actually was a cook in the army in France because he spoke French as well as English coming from Haiti uh, during World War I. Uh, he was also one of the young men that hung around with boxing champion, heavyweight champion of the world, Jack Johnson. So I grew up hearing so many Jack Johnson stories 
um, that was just unbelievable. I felt like I knew him, you know, myself. And you know, at that time, when I was growing up there, we did not have television. We did not have electricity in our house for many years. We had uh, kerosene lamps. I guess they use oil in those now. With uh, my grandparents, we read every night. And uh, we got a radio in about 1950, maybe 52 or 53, but they had to hook the radio up to a car battery. And uh, we would listen to radio uh, some nights, but we would read every night. And even though he was not formally educated himself, He's the smartest human being that I ever met. You know, not only was he a shaman and a herbalist and a businessman, you know, he was the black banker, you know, in the black communities in Eastern North Carolina, because in most instances, a black or colored people, we were colored back then. A colored person, like you really couldn't go to a bank and get a loan to buy a car or some land or anything like you know, that. You had to get someone to loan you the money or to co-sign for you, for you. And he had saved all of his money from the time he came back from oh, World War I and went to Philadelphia. Saved all of his like, your money and he came back south you know, with the money. Became a, a, quite a prominent person in the neighborhood. Small man, very quiet, very gentle man. Uh, so I grew up you know, with him. We read every night. We read Shakespeare. Uh, we read Mark Twain. We read Charles Dickens. And when we started out reading, when they adopted me, uh, they were my blood grandparents. Uh, but when they adopted me and took me in, thank goodness, uh, they were different kinds of people, my, my grandmother and my grandpa. Uh, we listened to radio, and we listened to radio primarily because most of the stations with Gabriel Heater and a lot of other people, the sh those shows came from the Midwest. And they wanted me to learn as early as six years old to speak what they called American. Uh, without the black dialect, without the Southern dialect. And that is the way that we did it by listening to radio shows. You know, the shadow, the phantom, those uh, radio shows that came on television. And uh, with the, the reading, they, ble they believed very strongly in reading because they believed that it built your vocabulary and you could travel uh, not just physically like you're in distance, but you could travel through t time just by opening a book. Uh, and that with great and famous writers from the past, uh, even if it was nine o'clock at night, which was very late then, or 9.30, I could sit down and get counsel from Benjamin Franklin just by opening a book and have him speak to me or, or Thomas Jefferson or George Washington Carver or any number of uh, other people. And with us, I guess that we were like a bit like you're different, different when uh, uh, very few people in the South were aware of Africa, I guess, because he came from Haiti being the only black nation on the planet that ever freed itself from slavery by defeating the French and uh, Napoleon. And they're still punishing them for doing that yeah, today. He was you know, different and was Africa aware. So I heard the stories about uh, from him about the great kingdoms 
in Africa, and this was like you know, during a time where if you were black, the, the, the only thing that you would hear about us or read about us that was positive, even in our school books was, you know, I think that you know, Mr. George Washington Carver got like you know, maybe a paragraph or a paragraph and a half. And uh, there would be uh, another few people that they might give one paragraph to, but it wouldn't be all of black history in our history books in school was just one page. But I was ahead of the rest of the kids because I heard these stories from my grandpa. His name was Kaya. You know, his American name was Sam. His real name was Kaya de la Court. But uh, after World War, when he went into the army, he figured he needed an American name. So he took the name Sam for Uncle Sam and Grant for the general that fought to free the black people in this you know, country. So he became Kaya Sam Grant. Uh, wow. So I had some advantages that a lot of other kids, neither black or white, had by being raised by that wonderful man and my grandmother. Uh, one of the things that he believed, which he told me at six years old, and we can talk about that now here another time, at six years old, he told me, he says, you, you got to get a job, baby. I said, the job? He says, yeah, yeah, yes, yes. You know, a man should have his, should have money in his pocket. And a man should help his family out. A uh, man should have like your job. So I, I walked and walked and I mean, for a number of weeks before I finally got a job. And uh, I can tell you very you know, briefly, you know, what happened on that white job with it, we, in our uh, neighborhood, we had a black and Cherokee gentleman who was Mr. Jesse Spicer. And he had the little general store in our neighborhood, which was called Dewdrop. I do drop in. <laughs> uh, yeah. I went around asking yeah. everybody for a job and they were saying, yeah, you, you, you're six years old. What are you going to do? You can't work and stuff. But Nobody would give me a job. You know, does, does your, does, does your, uh, your papa know that you're out here uh, uh, asking for a job? I said, you know, yeah, he told me to do it. Well, no one would give me a job, so I went to uh, Mr. Jesse Spicer's general store with food and a little and everything, not much larger than 7-Eleven today, but. You had everything in that little store. I went there and I asked him for a job. He says, no, you, you're too young. There's nothing you can do. So I said, well, I can work. And uh, I went home and the next day I, I kind of lifted my grandmother's broom and I just walked into Mr. Jesse's store, went to the bank and I started sweeping. And he, came back and he said, what, what are you doing? I said, Mr. Jesse, I, I, I can work. I can work, you know, see, I, I'll show you. You don't have to pay me like that. So he said, well, don't knock, him, don't knock anything over and just you'll do it and then you'll, you'll go ahead and I'll, I'll give you a, a soft drink. So I did that and you know what happened the next day? I was right back there again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sweet. He started to laugh at me, like you're there, and he let me hang around. I must have swept the store up. Oh man, over four or five hours on that same day, that second day, I must have swept the entire store up, yo, know, nine or ten times. As soon as I reached the front door, I would go to the back door and start doing it again. Long story short, uh, we. Uh, Third afternoon, before I could get there, I came home and Mama, my grandmother, says, uh, your papa wants to see you back there in his office. Mr. Jesse's here. I thought, oh my God, I'm in trouble now. Maybe I broke something. I went in and uh, my papa said, you know, uh, 
you know, sit down here. So I sit down, I thought, man, I'm gonna, I'm in trouble here now. And he says, Mr. Jensen says, you've been out of this store sweeping, sweeping up out there. So I said, yes, sir. And he said, well, he says he told you that you could, I said, I, I didn't charge him anything. I, I, I said, I just want him to see that I could work, that I was big enough to work. So uh, he said, well, he uh, wants to, he's here and he asked me if he could give you a job. And uh, so I looked at him and he said, and I told him that you, you're a man, he'd have to ask you. That was my first job. Wow. And uh, on that job, I started out making five cents a day. And uh, I was the happiest kid. I was the happiest <laughs> kid in North Carolina. When you, I got there. You did that at six years old. My, my twins are seven. They're underachieving. I got to have a talk with them. <laughs> <laughs> and when I got to sit down and talk. So and, with, and when I got paid, <laughs> 10 cents went to my grandmother every week. Yeah, I've definitely got to talk to my kids. Yeah, they've got to get out there. <laughs> they've got to earn their keep. With the pressures of working and helping the family out and during that time where there weren't a lot of options how did you get introduced to sports well in all of the little neighborhood games basketball uh football sand like games baseball i was always the last kid to get chosen by a team and I do mean I was the last. The, uh, and if there was an even number of kids there, then I would just have to stand and watch and hope that somebody would have to go home early. And then they would say, oh, well, okay, we need an even number, you, you can come on. But in football, I, I was never allowed to touch the ball or anything like your dad. I got ran over about it. <laughs> You know, with baseball, I was not much of a baseball player. So I was always in center field. And I mean, a long way back in center field because <laughs> at our age, no one was big enough to, to hit the ball and drive it like you're out there. Uh, by the time, so I was not a very good athlete, but I was being raised and conditioned by my grandfather and listening to the champion Jack Johnson stories and what he observed with champion Jack <clears throat> when they were on the road and they were like, you're doing, doing it. So I, I didn't know what I was gonna do. Yeah, you know, I boxed a little bit. We used to box for pennies and nickels, you know, the, the grown men during those times, the, all the teenage boys, we'd have the boxing matches with the little kids boxing. And if you won, you know, you could get maybe a nickel if you won three matches in a row and get maybe like you a penny if you didn't get knocked out for, for participating in it. You know, there, so I was eh, kind of okay there, but I never won a fight or anything there. Uh, but I knew that I wanted to play sports. And as we used to say, and I'm sure you've heard from your, uh, your parents that in the black community, we used to have a saying that if you want to get out of here, you'd better be able to sing, dance, or play ball. Otherwise, wow. yeah. you're, not gonna, you, you, you're not getting out of yeah. you know, here because, you know, see everybody, some people go to college out of our community, but everybody doesn't do it. The only other choice was to go into the military there. I couldn't dance then, and I still can't dance. <laughs> you know, you know, very well. I couldn't sing like you either. So I knew that sports had to be my way out. So I, 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 I figured that okay, uh, football is the big sport. You know, in the neighborhood and in high school and stuff. So I'm going to try for that. 
So in the ninth grade at six feet tall, 98 pounds, obviously I got cut. Was the first player in the history of the school that got cut. <laughs> wow, really? Really. My high school coach was Gideon T. Johnson. Our high school program in practice during the school year or whatever, practice lasted from six o'clock at night until 11 o'clock at night. You ran home, you walked home, you got your hitchhike, you did whatever you had to do, but you better be at school the next day and you better have your work, uh, your homework done. We ran that football program the same way that Paris Island, the Marine Corps boot camp was run back during that like your days. Uh, mm -hmm. Our coaches had better right and left hands than Joe Frazier or Muhammad Ali or Sugar Ray Robinson, like your whatever. You screwed up like you're there, you caught some lefts and rights. You find yourself on the ground. Uh, but they were never abusive. You were wrong whenever you got hit, whenever you got hit. But the strange and wonderful thing about them is if you played for them, even if you were second team or third team or whatever, they were so tough. And high school sports were segregated in the South then. Uh, so we never played against anything except other black high schools from different cities around the state. Uh, you know, there. Some great coaches. Coach Gideon Tom and Je Thomas Johnson had college offers, you know, to go and coach in the CIAA or the SWAC, uh, the Black Conferences, HBCUs, they call them now. Uh, but he stayed there. And uh, he, 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 built, he made men. He made men. So he thought that he had run me off the first year when I was a freshman, you know, there, told me to get off of his football field and don't come back out there. He wasn't going to be responsible for me getting hurt. But I never stopped going to practice. We had so many kids out there. And uh, one of the coaches was from our neighborhood, uh, from the neighborhood that I grew up in, you know, there. I would just stay over there near him kind of, and whenever Coach Johnson would come over my area, I would make sure that I never had <laughs> eye contact or anything with him until that way. I figured he didn't know that I was out there. I didn't miss a single practice that year. I practiced all practice. Uh, but of course, didn't get into any games or anything. <laughs> so... So that was my start there, you know, with him. And between he and my grandpa, mm -hmm. you know, they created me. And I don't hesitate with anybody who saw me play or whatever. I was Lawrence Taylor before there was Lawrence Taylor. When I came into the league, I think that was probably one of the first defensive players to come into the SEC or the Atlantic Coast Conference that put on a show as a defensive lineman. So I want to, we're going to definitely jump into that, but I, I want to ask you as you're in high school and you, you're you on the team, one of the leaders of the team. And as you talked about that time period, things were segregated. You didn't play against white teams. When did the idea, the thought come to you that, not only could you play in college, but there's going to be an opportunity to play at a predominantly white institution. Um, I, 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 I was hoping that I would get to do that, but at that time we all went north to play the Big Ten or West, or we played in the SWAC, or we played in the CIAA. With the Southern universities, um, when I was once they're a freshman, a sophomore, even a junior, and even a senior, like you're in high school, the idea of playing at a Southern university, major university, which we call the white schools, uh, 
It wasn't possible. That wasn't going to happen. No one was talking about it. No one was dreaming about it. But I knew that I was going to play, you know, someplace in the United States with over 40 offers. When I, during my sophomore year, Coach Johnson in the spring, I guess, after my freshman year, called me down to his office. And I thought, oh, man, I, I'm in some kind of trouble because, you know, he was the school disciplinarian, not the principal, uh, you know, whenever you did something you weren't supposed to do. So uh, someone from the principal's office called me and says, uh, Mr. Broaders, who was Professor Broaders, who was the principal, wants you to go to Coach Johnson's office. So I thought, oh my God, man, I'm gonna make you get it. He had the best left hand. And when he hit you with that left hand, it always picked you up off the ground before you hit the ground. I thought, okay, and then going down here, I, I must have done something. So I got down there and I went into his room and I, this leads into answering your question. I went into his like your room and uh, he had this <laughs> way, I don't know if you would call it a double, whatever, referring to you, to you sometimes. Come on, come over here, young lad. He was about 300, 350 pounds, as black as the shoes that I'm wearing here, like you are now. Uh, come over here. Uh, come on, you, come over here, you come, come on, come over here, young lad. So I walked over to his desk. He was sitting right here there. And he looked at me and he says, uh, didn't I tell you uh, that I didn't want you coming onto my football field? I thought, oh my God. Oh man. I, I said, yes, sir. He said, well, why did you keep coming? I wasn't gonna lie. That was just gonna make it worse, you know? So I just think you'll thought I'm gonna get it anyway. I'm gonna just tell them the truth. I said, coach, because I wanna be on the team. So he uh, waited, he looked at me. And he says, okay, he says, I'm gonna let you come back out again next week. But uh, you're gonna have to start putting on some ways, putting on some weight. I'm going to take you over here to Mumford Point, which is where all of the black Marines had done their basic training on the base of Camp Lejeune when I get there. So we got gems over there. Just start training over there. You just start eating all the food you can eat. So I got over there. Nobody worked out with weights then, but there were some little weights in the gems on base and stuff there. He introduced me to a few of the guys there. They got me started with weights. And as a matter of fact, in sports back then, they would say, it will make you muscle bound. Don't lift weights. The pros didn't lift. The colleges didn't lift. <laughs> Nobody would lift like your weights here then. I started to do that. So I came back uh, my second year. Not only did I make the team, I came back at about a hundred that that year, I would say at about a hundred and sixty-five pounds, 160, 165. Mm -hmm. I'm still the smallest guy on the team. <laughs> Junior year, I came back at about 205 and came back about 225 my senior year. But uh, I became his starter just because I knocked the daylights out of the guy that was the starter, knocked him out cold two times in one night. He was a senior, much older, but I literally knocked him cold two times in a row. And uh, then by my sophomore year, I was a really starting to become a dominant player in the state. And uh, well, I was, I mean, you know, my junior year. By that time, you know, I was, I was looking. And from the time I was about eight years old, 
I had wanted to play for the Baltimore Colts. That was my dream. I didn't know that it was going to happen. By the time I was a junior in high school, I didn't know who I was going to play for, but I knew I was going to play for someone with, with Johnson. The thing that he said to me when he called me into that room that like you then he told me, I'm going to let you come back out for my team. And he says, no, if you do everything that I tell you to do, and if you never question me, he says, I believe that I'll get you a college scholarship. Man, at that time, six feet tall, 98 pounds, when they, is it, with everybody laughing at me at the barbershop when I'm saying, I'm gonna make the high school team. <laughs> Uh, and I'm thinking of a scholarship. Oh, okay. Well, all this is kind of connected, like you'll hear. And uh, said, okay, I guess if he says it, if Coach Johnson says it, he can make it happen. And I was walking out, and he and I had talked about this years after that. He. I was about to go out the door and he says, young lad, come back, come back over here. So I came back and thought he was gonna change his mind. And he says, if you do everything that I tell you to do and never quit on anything that you're doing, he says, I believe we can go further than college. Now, he'd never said anything like that to anybody else. Yeah, I know it. Uh, why he said that to this little kid who wasn't even a decent player, who was the only player in high school that got cut, what made him say that at that time, I don't know. He didn't know either. We talked about it after I was actually in the pros and I would go down and we'd go riding around and stuff like that. He didn't know, uh, you know, either. But it worked out. So, how did with so much that went on um with you as a player in terms of your growth you 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 gained practically a, almost 100 pounds uh over the course of 3 to 4 years and with the climate of america the climate of north carolina how did the opportunity to attend wake forest and to be the the catalyst for what became such a major change. How did that come into the picture for you as an option, specifically Wake Forest and the opportunity to, to make that change? Um, well, Kevin, I had signed with Michigan State and actually had signed with Tennessee a and Tennessee State too. I was going to one of those, those were gonna be one of those schools, it was probably gonna be Michigan State because it was obvious that they were going to win a national championship in those following four years because they, Duffy Doherty had gone all over the country, he had gone as far as Hawaii and Texas with my team, Baltimore Colt teammate, Bubba Smith and business partner years later, and Clinton Jones, top running back, high school running back in the nation, George Webster and out of South Carolina, they they had like five All Americans on the team at one time. Maybe, and if you counted the second team All Americans, they had, I think they had seven. Wow! So I was going there, and I had signed, and was certainly going there. And then these three crazy white men in the at a little school in Winston-Salem called Wake Forest University that was primarily known for golf and basketball. 
lost their minds and went crazy <laughs> and decided that they were going to be come the first school major university in the South. Maryland had integrated north of the Mason-Dixon line before in the ACC with Daryl Hill, who transferred from the Naval Academy for one year. But in Dixie, there was no one that looked like you or I playing at any major university. And there were no white kids playing at Grambling or Jackson or any place like that. These three crazy white men, Dr. Harold Tribble, president of Wake Forest University, Coach Bill Tate, the new head coach of the football team at Wake Forest College at that time, and a brand new young man, athletic director, Dr. Gene Hooks. They lost their mind and decided that they were going to be the ones that were going to integrate sport in the South. I didn't know anything about it or anything like that, but I got another call to come to Coach Gideon Johnson's like your office one day and uh, Come over here, young lad, sit down. I said, yes, sir. You may have your mind where you're going? He said, yes, sir. I said, where are you going? I said, I, I, I've already signed with Michigan State. I said, but I signed a letter of intent with Tennessee, Tennessee State also. So he held up a picture uh, from the newspaper. He says, do you, know this, do you know who this white man is? I said, no, sir. So this is Coach Bill Tate. He's a new coach up there at Wake Forest. So he and the president are getting ready to integrate uh, major team sports at universities, at, at colleges in the South. So I'm thinking, well, what the heck does that have to do with me? I'm from the Michigan State. I said, oh, oh, OK. So he said, this is where we are going, baby. I'm thinking, this is where we're, we're, we're going, everything. He said, this is where we're going. He says, uh, I'm going to call. And you're going to write a letter. Sit down and write this letter out here like you're right now. Tell them if they're interested, you'll come. If they'll scholarship you. I did it. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I don't want to go to Wake Forest. They get beat up every weekend. <laughs> every weekend. Uh, yeah. Long story short, I went up on the trip. Brian Piccolo was my escort, escorted me around wonderful guy, et cetera. And uh, they said, well, we've got two more that are coming with you, William Smith out of Sterling High School in Greenville, South Carolina, and Butch Henry. I knew Butch out of Dudley High School in Greensboro, North Carolina. Thinking, I don't care who's coming. <laughs> I, I want to be on a national championship team. <laughs> but when your parents told you to do something, back during that time, or your coach told you to do something, that's what you were going to do. You didn't give a back talk. So that's when I went up to Wake Forest and mama, my grandmother said, you can't go up there, baby. Those white boys are gonna kill you in your sleep. And my grandfather, whose favorite sport was like your boxing, never missed the heavyweight championship fight that was fought on American soil. Personal friend of Jack Johnson, once again, and Joe Lewis, who became a good friend of mine, uh, you know, in the years that passed. 
uh, he says, no. He says, I, if you, you go up there and if in everything that you do, don't just do your best, you do better than your best in everything, you hear me? You do better than your best in everything. I, I felt it. I understood what he was you know, saying. And I knew the responsibility that was coming with that. And I knew that it would have to be that way. He says, just like this young boy says, white people used to pay $100 to sit on the front row to see Champion Jack fight. And he says, when this new boy that's boxing out of Louisville, Kentucky, Clay, like you're right now, he says a lot of people hate him you know, right now. And he talks a lot. He makes people like you're mad. He says, but people pay. He says, someday he's going to be an American hero. I thought, wow, OK. So I went to Wake Forest with that attitude. Uh, no question in my mind that I was going to be the best damn player on the damn team. I knew it before I got there. There was. I knew that I was going to be the best player in the Atlantic Coast Conference before I got there because I had been prepared, I had the right mindset, and I understood that everything starts in mind. Anything that we see is created in mind. It is an idea before it becomes a reality and exists here. So I was prepared. So when I went to Wake Forest, I knew the entire story. I knew how it was going to end. I knew exactly what my career was going to be there. Not so much because I was so smart, but because of my grandpa, because of Coach Gideon Johnson, because of the high school teachers like you know, that I had who academically at my high school, Georgetown High School, you had to perform. We had probably more PhDs teaching at my high school out of the HBCUs they go now than any white high school at that time had teaching in their high schools. I want to ask you, you decided to come to Wake. Well, the decision was made for you to come to Wake. I'll put it that way. That, that's correct. That was, <laughs> and I didn't want to go. <laughs> and so you show up to Wake, and did you – know or understand at the time the the impact that you were having and the change that you were creating just by being there before you even show everyone how great of a player you are did you when you look at the way things are now did you did you envision that what you did was going to lead to what you see now well, I knew that, you know, during the civil rights movement, like you know, then, 63, 64, moving ahead, I was fortunate enough to become acquainted with pretty much all of the black leaders in the civil rights movement passed through to check on us because we were the point of the spear. We were representing, as we used to say back then, to them, we were representing the race at that time. So I knew that that was there, but I wasn't about, that, about to let that get in the way of what it was that I was there to accomplish. That was just a part of it you know, there. I was aware of the responsibility that came with like your that. I never joined a single like your group, even though I associated with like your all of all of them. I knew Dr. King, uh, Andy Young. Everybody was younger you know, then. Uh, Abernathy, Malcolm X, uh, Mr. Mohammed, we, uh, Rap Brown. 
Stokely Carmichael. We knew all of them, not at a distance. We knew them because we had sat and talked with them, with them coming and checking through during those turbulent times. Uh, and, and, and they were always good for our lunch. And they came wow. you know, through town over in East Winston, take us over there. Uh, and we were so isolated on campus, you know, there that my focus was what my gr grandpa had me promise and commit to becoming better than the best, at giving better than my best at everything that I did. So the rest of it came along with it. I didn't care about being accepted on campus and the campus was split. But then in the black community, the black community was split as far as us going there because they felt that we, yes, as uh, LeBron said uh, when he went south, they felt that we should take our talents to the historical black colleges if we weren't going to go like you know north. So there were some whites who weren't too happy about us being there. There were some blacks who weren't too happy. And on Wake Forest, that uh, student body, the athletes were totally accepting you know, of us. Faculty and administration, the same thing applied there. There were some who were behind us 100%. Well, a few of them were. And then there were some who literally let us know, Yo, I'm not for this experiment, as it was said to me. So don't count on me for anything. Even like you're there and doing the work academically and whatever, imagine what it must be like you're the first time that you do an A term paper and the professor tells you, this is an A term paper. Who did it? I did it. I worked with my roommate a couple of the entire semester, got it like you're done. And then for that professor to say to you, no, I, I'm not going to give you an A. A, color, a colored person is not capable of doing this kind of work academically. So they gave me the damn C. Uh, but that wasn't a distraction to you know, me there you know, either. Uh, after I got there, I was, Michigan State came for me uh, during my sophomore year, they knew that I was going to have to have a shoulder surgery for my freshman year, even though I did make the all-ACC freshman team back then. We had to play a year freshman ball uh, before you could play your three varsity years. Uh, I made the all-ACC freshman team make you still playing with one arm. And then uh, when the season was over there, they performed surgery on the shoulder, I think, and fixed it you know, there. But uh, Michigan State came down to try to get me to transfer. And uh, I was going to transfer. And the coaches didn't know about it or whatever. Our trainer, old rough, tough, but not as tough as he put on, Doc Martin, Lewis Martin, somehow got wind of the fact that Michigan State was in town and had me in a room over at the Sheraton Hotel and was taking me to Stay's restaurant, buying me steaks, was trying to get me to transfer. He talked with me. And what he said to me, he said, you know, I know, nobody else knows, but I know that Duffy Doherty is down here himself trying to get you to transfer. And he said, you, got a lot of responsibilities and you're going to do what you want to do. Everybody thought Doc was an old rebel. They thought that he was a bigot, whatever, but he wasn't. He's was really a big pussycat, put on quite a show, and I knew it. Uh, he says, but uh, there's a lot of people counting on you. 
He says, I'll tell you what. He says, Yo, if, if, if you stay, if you stay, I'm in your corner 100%. You'll always be able to count on me. So I thought, okay. So I stayed. Well, I'm glad you stayed. And now knowing what I just found out from you about Michigan State, they have just become our number one rivals now. <laughs> Forget Carolina, it's Michigan State. We've got to get them on the schedule more often now. <laughs> so you talked about uh, Doc Martin, but you also mentioned uh, Dr. Tribble, uh, Dr. Gene Hooks, and, and, and Coach Bill uh, yeah. Tate. And talk about the role they played, not just in getting you to Wake Forest, but also in being there for you once you got to Wake Forest and even beyond just the, that freshman year, what, what role did they play in being there and, and being so supportive of what you're doing? Well, I'll start with uh, Dr. Tribble, who was one of the kindest human beings I've ever met. Uh, he and I, every, get a little note, probably <laughs> uh, when football season was over, get a little note for him, especially during the spring, at least once every day, you know, two weeks, you know, saying that you uh, meet me over in Renola Gardens on the big oak tree out in the middle of an uh, area there. So we'd meet, we'd walk, he'd talk, he'd ask me how are things going. Not always telling the truth. Uh, he just wanted to make sure that I was like, oh, that he wanted to make sure that I was okay. And uh, I, I, I'm, I, I, I might make us forfeit all of our games, you know, from you know, those years that I was there like you're right now. You know, every time they, you know, you know, not not ten bucks, like you know, whatever. Doctor Tribble was always when I left from the garden, like you in the afternoon. I always had at least three or four dollars more in my pocket uh, because my grandpa didn't believe in giving you any money when you mm. were away at school. Not a nickel. You're a man. You're on your own. We got fifteen dollars for laundry money. That didn't go very far. Uh, but not ten dollars, not twenty, not twenty-five, but say no less than three or four dollar bills, which was very helpful at that time. Every time we walked or whatever, I went back home with a few extra bucks in my pocket there, which I needed, and. Uh, you know, could you know, use because they, I mean, I had to buy my supplements and my protein and all of that stuff, which had you know, did their training table was great, but you know, with the vitamins, vitamins, all the stuff, I, I had everything on the market there. <laughs> um, with Dr. Hooks, like you're in a very like you're quiet sort of like your way, uh, he was very encouraging. You're sticking it out. We knew that he was there like your force. With Coach Tate riding with him down to his television show in Raleigh or Durham that he had down there and talking with him like you about it. I think that he and I got to know each other and he got to understand the tradition that I came out of. At Wake Forest, we'd practice what, an hour and a half or something like you know, that. They were, when they announced when we first got there, they said, if you're not working really hard and everything, we'll go to an hour 45 or two hours. I accidentally broke out laughing at the thing when they were introducing all of the new players who were coming in, the freshman players. It wasn't a banquet, but a little meet and greet with alumni and everybody. I kind of broke out laughing. Nobody else was laughing. 
the reason I laugh, you start, you're going to practice an hour, 45 minutes. I practice every night during the school year under Gid Johnson from 6 p.m. until 11 p.m. And there was no standing around like, you know, talking. It was all contact. I thought that it was a joke. And I thought, are they really serious? We're just going to practice in an hour and a half or maybe two hours. This is going to be real sweet. <laughs> practice was a vacation to me. It literally was a vacation. I never even got tired uh, you know, in practice. But with uh, Bill, he... Tate, Coach Tate, he, I don't know whether he had talked with Coach John Snake or not, but he, uh, he caught on really quick and he built the defense around me. And like at that time, we didn't have, well, we got it named after that. On defense, uh, I became what you call the monster. Mm -hmm. I went anywhere that I wanted to go. You know, my job was to go where the ball is. With my teammates, they all bought into it. So <laughs> there are a lot of like your instances where it's guys like John McQueeny, who will hopefully be at our affairs coming up and in, in, in whatever. John would grab two guys and hold them so that they couldn't get to me so that I could get there and make the tackle. So a lot of what I did was done because of the system that Tate set up and because my teammates went along with your know, it. The other thing as far as like your coaching, under Coach Gid Johnson with him, there, one of the things that he would like you'll say to me, like a lot of times when we were like you're playing, go invisible, go invisible on him. And I could do it. Yeah. I took that to Wake Forest like, with me. Tate yeah. caught on like you're to it. Now, and then actually, I think he sent the system back up to Illinois after I left and stuff there. But the way that you go invisible is, I start out in one place and then I break those basic rules of like your football in such a way, but I had been trained to do it and everything. They said, oh, if you're on your line, never cross over, et cetera. The guy that was blocking me would never even touch me like a lot of like your times because I would cross over and step or like you away from him. And if he was coming in a straight line or whatever, he, he'd never even like you touch me. And then the other part of being like you're invisible was uh, with him. And I know you'll appreciate this. And I hope you start doing the podcast. Well, with Coach Johnson, it was you can tell where the play is going as soon as the man that's in front of you that's responsible for you takes one step. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Body language, the direction that he steps mm -hmm. in, you know, how he comes out, et cetera, you read like you're that. You learn, yep, you read that offensive lineman, yep. Okay. On the second step with Johnson, it should be, you know exactly how you're going to beat him, how you're going to neutralize where he's trying to get to. And on the third step, by the time he takes his third step, you should know exactly where the ball is going. You should know exactly where the ball is that you're going. So then you just break all kinds of rules. You do whatever you have to do, but you just get there. 
even if it's all the way on the other side of the line or, or whatever. Coach Tate and my teammates at Wake Forest allowed me to play that way. 